Welcome to the Workforce Australia Self-Employment and Entrepreneurship Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Turner. Join me for real talk, tips and tricks from entrepreneurs who've walked the walk. We acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional owners of the lands and waterways on which we live and work and recognise their continuing significance and connection to country. Today, we are meeting on Bundjalung country. We pay our respects to elders past and present. We honour the stories, traditions and living cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and commit to building a brighter future together. I would also like to acknowledge the Jugan people in recognition of our podcast guest today, Nadala Barker. Nadala Barker is a successful self-employed Indigenous businesswoman. She is a musician, a singer-songwriter, a model, a sustainability advocate and custodianship educator. She seamlessly navigates the nuances of these different roles and is one of the most talented women I've had the pleasure of meeting. She is simply sparkling. There's almost nothing this woman cannot do. In fact, the tiny home behind us, she built from scratch herself. I'm in awe. <laughs> Thank you so much for making the time to chat with us today, Nadala. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> and allowing us to film here on this beautiful land. It's so gorgeous. Um, so tell me a little bit about your background, how you grew up and how that inspired you to live a purpose-driven life. And that then translated into this amazing purpose-driven business model that you've, you've got going. Sure. Um, so I had quite a unique upbringing. Um, my father is Aboriginal. He's Jogun and Jabba Jabba from the West Kimberleys, which is where I was born and I grew up in the first part of my life. And my mother is an anthropologist. She's French. And so part of my life, I also grew up in Paris. So from the get-go, my older sister and I moved around between worlds a lot. Um, because you can't really go more different than no. the remote Kimberley and Paris. Although I'm a little bit jealous, like <laughs> two very different juxtaposed places, but equally as beautiful. Equally as beautiful. <laughs> um, and I was really privileged to grow up in a family that simultaneously has really strong culture still. So on my Indigenous side, I was dreamt into this world by my grandmother and my other elders. I grew up, you know, practicing culture yeah. on country. And on the flip side of that, I also grew up in, you know, an academic world where my mother helped me foster my ideas and critical thinking. And on equal parts in both sides, highly politically involved communities yeah. right, who think the world and who rethink solutions. And so I think from the get go, my life has been anchored in that. Yeah. In the acknowledgement that there isn't one way to live. There isn't one way to find your purpose, that there's as many solutions as people alive and those solutions can look very different. Yeah. You can speak to an auditorium of thousands or you can speak to the birds. Both are equally as important yeah, if they bad. are in line with you and your message. So it was simultaneously daunting because it meant that I didn't have a model to cling on to. Yeah. And I think I spent a lot of my earlier years in my late teens and early 20s relentlessly searching for my solution, yep. relentlessly trying to understand the world and its complexities. And I lived in New York and in the Amazon rainforest in Colombia and traveled all over the world, doing things from human rights law to permaculture gardens, yeah. kind of <laughs> almost furiously searching for that one thing that would be mine. But as it turns out, it was more than one thing. And I yeah. think that's the life that I've fostered now is something that really lines up with the multiplicity of being when we're human and the multiplicity that I grew up with. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful thing. You've had exposure to so many mm. different thought patterns, worldviews, cultures, that you're able to actually draw from that and, and really be quite a thought leader for others. Mm. Um, so talk to me about how you've woven that kind of into your music career and how that's translated into music for you. Sure. So my father's a musician and in the early years of my life, I grew up going on tour with him. So, you know, we'd do tours through Europe, through northern parts of Africa, all over the world. And so I grew up playing music and singing. It was always part of my upbringing. But then I decided that if I wanted to change the world, I need to do something a little bit more serious, yep. which is what <laughs> led me to human rights law and public policy and social economy. And 
what I found was that I was in these meeting rooms full of really important people making really important decisions, but that I couldn't get hurt in that yeah. context and that I wasn't actually producing any change, at least not in the direction that I wanted to. Yeah. And, you know, after quite an intense burnout that led to a part of my career being left behind, <laughs> yeah. um, I started music again more so as as therapy for myself and as a means to kind of replenish myself. But one day I was sitting down in a room and I wrote a song called Colors of My People, which then led on to being in an EP. And I sent it to my mother and my mother sent it to a few people and it landed back in a loop of thousands of people. And I kept getting all these messages from different people saying like, this was, made me feel a certain way and this made me feel empowered to do this. And I was like, oh, maybe there's something to it. Yeah. So I decided to commit to music again in a different kind of way. Yeah. I was then a part of a project called the Tamba Project, which was my first time in a studio, and this was two years ago, two wow. years and a bit, where I was asked in collaboration with Kyle Lionheart and Billy Otto, the three of us wrote a song for the earth. Um, and so when I was a part of this experience, I was like, oh, maybe the music industry is different to what I yeah. thought it was. And so in that context, I was really exposed to, you know, that maybe music can be a tool that simultaneously makes me feel good and makes the world feel good, which led me to then record um, the Colors of My People EP, which initially was just going to be a project to inspire people. And then I decided to weave carbon neutrality into it, which was the idea that I calculated the carbon budget of my EP. Yeah. So I included things like, you know, all my band members driving to and from practice, to and from the studio, the power usage, uh, the power usage that it takes to hold the data online, the email exchanges with my publicists, all that sort yeah. of thing, came up with an amount of, okay, how much does this cost in terms of carbon? Then I was fortunate enough to team up with a local brand, Spell, who paid for the carbon offset of my EP before it was Beautiful. released. And then for every stream, 40% goes to more carbon capturing, which actually goes to a farm in Tasmania that grows kelp. So good. Yeah. So you're actually like affecting very real change whilst you are educating people through music. And I think that's the beautiful thing about music, right? It gives us a platform to reach people in their hearts. Absolutely. Um, you know, it really makes people open their ears and, and their minds. Um, they, they don't have their defences up as much when you're talking to them through music. I actually read on your website that you wrote the title track for the Colours of My People in one sitting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I think with your music, like you have your music and you have sustainability advocacy, you have corporate consultancy. How did you come about, I guess, establishing different channels for revenue as like someone that's self-employed? Was mm -hmm. that something that happened just, it evolved or was it something that you more, it was calculated and you, you planned out? The initial part of it definitely evolved on its own. The first time I did um, this corporate offering that you kind of just mentioned, I was invited to do that by yeah. someone who'd seen me perform. Okay. And my performances very much lean into what you were just speaking about and to the way in which music allows a certain openness, yeah. allows us to practice togetherness, yeah. you know, so that you can see a band together and be like, hey, I remember you from the dance floor. Maybe we can now talk about more complicated things. Yeah like things that are really important to us, right? So the, these amazing capacities to reach people in a state where we can have difficult conversations without starting in bias. And she saw me, so when I perform generally, I'll play a song and then equally as long speak between songs. And she asked me, could you do something for that for our training? And I did it once and it worked incredibly well yeah. because it offered something that was new both for me and both for them, it answered questions that they didn't necessarily know they wanted answered in that moment around custodianship, around feeding the why. And I think this is why so much of these alternative inputs in businesses are so important, yeah. right? Because there is so much that responds to the answer how. We sit in boardrooms day after day after day in meetings, day after day after day, answering, how do we get there? How do we get there? And we always seem to hit walls. Yeah. And my belief is that what's lacking is the why. Yeah. And that why might be different for everyone. But for me in my custodial work, it's answering that 
we engage in these conversations because we care, yeah. because we're custodians, because we understand that we have deep set belonging in the world yeah. and that we have a shared responsibility to protect that world. That's it. I actually read on your website something that as someone that's a white Australian, I found really kind of moving. You, it actually says that you acknowledge all those Indigenous and non-Indigenous who are fighting and reconciling in the name of our shared earth. Mm -hmm. And that just spoke to me volumes about where your heart's at and, and what you're trying to achieve. Um, you tell me a little bit about how that is woven into to the work you do it with corporates because you don't just sing, do you? You opened the Nexus Summit in Sydney recently, rubbing shoulders <laughs> with Osher in the green room. Um, <laughs> what do you actually do um, when you go in and work with corporates? Yeah, so it feels like a difficult question to answer when trying to figure out as a general rule what it is that I do with corporates because it's very, very much tailored to that meeting, to that gathering, yeah. to that summit or whatever it is. What I would generally do is have a little chat with the organizers, say, what, what are your goals? What is it that you're doing? Who are you? Yeah. Because I think that often we get lost in, you know, trying to tick political correctness boxes trying to generalize, trying to find a fit all situation and solution. And I don't think that that works. Yeah. I think what I offer to corporates is a really, really tailored lens to remember their own power, yeah. to remember their own purpose, to kind of create a, a, a collective drop in a situation where everybody is on the same lines. Everybody starts off at the same point. A good piece of feedback that I got um, when I was working with a particular corporate group and they had a big gathering of all the environmental leaders for Red Cross was that they said that after my performance, they were able to have a meeting that was more productive than the 10 past ones. And the reason being is that they started their conversation by sharing with each other why they were in the room why they did the job that they did. Yeah. And what they did is that they wrote it down as they went. And then they highlighted the words that they all have in common. And then that's where they started. Yeah. And I think that perfectly sums up what I'm trying to do with this work is to step into a softer space, not to be holistic hippie world, yeah. but to actually allow us to be more productive in conversation because we remember where we start because I think the problem with a lot of business nowadays is that we walk into these rooms and this is something that I've practiced when, you know, I was working in public policy and human rights law. I walk into the room with all my knowledge, with my three degrees behind me and a master's and I say, well, I know what I am and I know that everybody else in the room has three or more degrees. So we set up and we all know. Yeah. And we expect that we're all on the same line, but yeah. we might not be. Yeah. Right? And I think that, that in some is what I do. Yeah. It's so to try and create a base of purpose. Yeah, by stripping it back to that human element and our commonalities as, yeah. as humans and, and what does inspire us and, and where exactly. we are. We have that connected. Yes. Yeah. And particularly in, you know, corporate situations where either it's a meeting with people from all over the world that don't necessarily have the same ethical beliefs. Yeah. Or, you know, very high ranking people in corporate settings who all have very different departments to look after. And I think this is something in general conversation that, you know, is often shown on corporate people by the environmental movement. I was like, these are the bad guys. And I'm like, these are people who have huge amounts of responsibility. Yeah. You have thousands, potentially tens or hundreds of thousands who are reliant on them. Yeah. On them figuring out the solutions, on giving direction. Yeah. It's a huge we can't responsibility. possibly, <laughs> you know, set them out of the question. Yeah. For them to have a clear mind, for them to work with people with equal power into a common direction, wouldn't we want that to be the conversation? Yeah. To reinstill environmentalism and, you know, custodianship at that level so that the entire business can move? Yeah, 100%.
I love, I love like your passion for teaching <laughs> custodianship and indigenous culture. You also work at a bush school in the Northern Rivers, don't you? <laughs> I love this. I remember hearing um, a couple of really cute stories about some of the kids there, which is, which is pretty amazing. It's like you've, you've actually got multiple income streams as someone that's self-employed. Do you ever find that that's hard to manage as far as time and income? Yeah, so I definitely do find it hard to manage. Not so much when, um, to put it bluntly, I was less successful yeah. <laughs> and I had more time. What I find now is that I have too big of a workload to manage myself. Yeah. What I also find is it can be quite difficult to switch between roles. Yeah. So a really perfect example of this is a few months ago I had, I was doing two performances at the Better Futures Forum in Canberra on a Monday afternoon. That Monday morning I was at Bush School. Then Monday night I flew to Brisbane to do a performance for Big Sound. Tuesday I was back down in Byron for a show. Then I got flown to Cairns for another talk, then back here. And then on Thursday I got to Bush School and I said something and all the kids burst out laughing. And I was like, what? why are you guys laughing? And they're like, why do you sound so formal? Yeah. I'm in the wrong shoes. Exactly. It's like I'm in the wrong shoes and it just took me a second to, to ground back in. Yeah. But at the same time, I do love having all those different jobs and all those different um, ways to occupy my time for multiple reasons. The first being that I like diversity in my life and in my work. Yeah. But also in terms of income, I think that the higher paying work of, you know, the stuff that I do with corporate allows me to do work in a bush school where I don't quite get the income that I need for my life for building my house and all that kind of thing. Yeah, so I need to also think, oh, these are my passions and I need to be able to still do my purpose driven work. But then I need to be able to fund my other projects. Yeah. Right. At the moment, I'm saving up to record another album. Beautiful. That doesn't happen yeah. on a bush school teacher wage. No. No. So I think it's really important when you are self-employed and when you do have really big dreams and really big projects to think about the wider picture. It doesn't mean you need to do the absolute grind of I'm going to work this job that I hate. Yeah. What it means is being smart yeah. in the type of work and in how you split your time. Yeah. Acknowledging that it probably will be significantly more work than a nine to five. Yeah. <laughs> I work on average 60 Common hours a week. Common isn't it? hundred percent. Work for yourself and you'll have so oh. much flexibility and free time. <laughs> yeah, it's just, but yeah. it's a lifestyle that if you can sit in that discipline of also taking the rest when you need it, yeah. of being able to organize yourself and accepting the help, yeah. then it works really well. And I've also gotten to a point where, as I said, it's too much work for me. So I offset to an assistant the things that I don't really want to deal with or that yeah. aren't my genius yeah so I'm not the best with spending time on my computer yeah so my planning and my calendar goes to the assistant and she deals with that yeah and the invoicing right because I could I can spend my time better I can make more money in that 15 minutes that Absolutely. it takes me to answer by being on stage and doing something else yeah and it brings me more joy yeah. And I think it's really, we speak a lot at the moment on social media, I see it coming up a lot, whether we call it dharma or ikigai or purpose, yeah. it's finding that sweet spot between what you're really good at yeah. and being real with yourself, not going like, oh, I can do this, I can manage it. But going, what are you actually genuinely good yeah. at? What can you make money from? Yeah. And what can you bring the world? And I think that's something that a lot of self-employed people and, and small business owners, they really they have trouble identifying that point where, okay, I need to actually outsource. And, and they often feel like, oh, I can't, you know, afford to outsource, whereas their time is actually more valuable spent on their business instead of in it, you know. How did you identify when you were at that point where you were like, okay, I, I need an assistant mm. now? Was it kind of a leap of faith? Did, were you it was a leap like of faith and also an absolute necessity because balls were starting to drop. Yeah. I was juggling way too many things. I didn't have time. I was forgetting to do certain things. I was showing up tired and not giving 100%, particularly at bush school. And so it became very obvious to me that I needed the help. Yeah. In terms of relinquishing the control, that was the really hard part. Because as someone who has existed in worlds where I've consistently had to prove my worth, 
And still to this day, I have to show up in rooms full of men in suits who make 20 to 30 times the amount that I make in a year. Yeah. And I have to show up from my paddock and tiny house that currently doesn't have power or running water. Oh, it's getting And there. play the part. <laughs> yeah, 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 100%. And I have to sit in that confidence. And if I'm showing up frazzled and tired, yeah. then that starts to bleed yeah. away and away and away. Yeah. And so I also, what I realized is that outsourcing the things that I didn't really love doing, like planning my calendar and doing my invoices, yeah. allowed me to get the productive rest so I could show up in the confidence and be this version of myself who I want to be, who was something, one who is deserving of a seat at the table yeah. with a clear head and sharp thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't actually have a manager or an agent, do you? Mm -hmm. That's all done by yourself. So obviously a, an assistant would help with some of those administrative type roles. Yeah. But how do you, I guess, promote yourself to get more work? And how do you kind of go about that whole branding thing and image? Because often, you know, your manager and your agent take care of a lot of that and instruct you on that. Yeah, well, I'm lucky enough that some of my work, as you've mentioned, I've and kind of resolves that because yeah. I do work as a model as well, which gives me a lot of content to be able to yeah. you know, put new images up on my yeah. website. I make sure that I record certain performances to be able to you know, showcase my work. And I think yeah. that's really where my work lives is in this area that's, that's new. Yeah. And that answers a question and a need that most people don't know that they have. So it's really difficult to explain my work, particularly my corporate work, because, you know, you can say to someone, I'm a carpenter. Yeah. And people know what it means. You know that they can build a fence, they can build a house, they can fix a hole in the roof. But there's no word for what I do. There's yeah. no name for what I do. They're yeah. just me. Yeah. You are your brand. I am my brand. Yeah. Which means simultaneously, I need to be very careful in how I show myself to the world. Yeah. Which means for anybody who is in this position of being self-employed, every interaction that you have is you building yourself as a brand. Yes. Right? It's not to cheapen human existence into being a brand, but it's important yeah. to take care in the words that you use when you're replying to emails, to not do it in the line of the supermarket in a half intentional way, to take the time to network, to take the time to pay people the respect that they deserve by reaching out to you for your work. Yeah to acknowledge the privilege that you have to be holding their attention in that moment, right? To be cautious Absolutely. of how you present yourself to the world. And to also, you know, just when you're doing the thing that you're doing, when you're performing your genius, to take the attention and care and trust that the work that you're doing is high enough quality and is providing a service that will build on itself. And I think, yeah. I'm now at the point where that's why I've gotten the assistant in order to help me promote my work further. But so yeah. far in the last year, all of the work that I've gotten has been from people who've seen me do yeah. a performance and asked me to do the same for them. Yeah. And I think for me, you know, in an economic sense, it's not the most viable, but for me, it's a really good sign that what I'm doing is working. Absolutely. Because it means that people want more. And I think that's really a good sign if the demand is there. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. And that's an awesome point. You know, when you are your brand, those relationships you build and that work that you put in to do that extra networking, to make those connections and build authentic relationship with people are what are going to build your business because you are your brand. And when people yeah. get to know you and they develop that affinity with you, then they're going to book you more and more. Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you price yourself, because I know that um, in the arts industry, it can be very, everyone wants, you know, time for print for models. They want, you know, we'll gift you this, we'll give, you know, and mm -hmm. give us, it's all about the exposure and it's not yeah. really. Um, <laughs> how does that kind of, how do you respond to that um, request to do things for free or that type of thing and make sure that you're being paid appropriately for the quality of service that you're providing? Yeah. So I think one of the really big things I remind myself of always is that nothing is ever cheap or free. It's just that someone else is paying the price, right? Absolutely. So if someone wants a service that. from me for free, <laughs> yes. what they're asking me is to spend my own value for them. Yeah. So to answer bluntly, I don't work for free. Good. Never. Yeah. What I do is that I work on a sliding scale of capacity. 
So I will say, for example, you know, people reach out and go, oh, how much do you charge for um, your collective drop-ins? And I'll say, oh, well, I have a window between this amount and this amount. And they're very, very large windows. And then I ask the person in front of me, how much can you pay? Yeah. How much is realistic for you to pay for my service? Yeah. Right? Most of the time, and this is no exaggeration, people will pay the top third. Yeah. Because that's genuinely their capacity. And I think if you ask people within a window, yeah. and, you know, I don't work for under this amount, yeah. what that does is that it allows me then to offer scholarships. Yeah. Which I price on myself. So I say, you know, if I get paid over a certain amount, I put aside that minimum fee. And I say, well, yeah. that minimum fee can go to one other person okay. or one other service. But I never work at deficit in myself because I need to be the one valuing my energy and my time and my skill. That's so right. I cannot work at deficit. Yeah. Or what it means is that I am the one paying the price. Absolutely. And I cannot offer something where I'm the one paying the price. Absolutely. And I think a lot of that comes back to your self-belief and your self-worth, which is um, so important as a business owner where you are self-employed and you are literally selling yourself every single day. Because if you don't have that self-belief, you really can't, you know, if you don't believe in yourself, no one else is going to. <laughs> exactly. And particularly with the arts, this is true. And this is something that runs in my head a lot is that you are the one that values your work. Yeah. Right. And if you don't have the self-belief and you say, oh, no, my songs aren't that good. I can't ask for this much money to play. You are letting your own self-esteem and lack thereof affect the value of your work. Yeah. So I separate myself from my music, not in the sense of, you know, my work exists over here and I exist over there. But how much I price my work and how people feel about my work has nothing to do with me which makes it significantly easier because when people will always try to negotiate in the music industry, be like, oh, can we do it for a little bit less? I say no, because it's not a commentary on me. It's a commentary on my work and I'm in charge Absolutely. of valuing my work. I'm the only person who can not only value it, but stand up for it. Yeah. And if I can't stand up for my own work, then how do I expect the world to accept it? 100%. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm a huge believer in price creates perception. You know? 100%. If you could buy... If Mazda was all of a sudden costing you the same as a Maserati, you'd look at Mazdas a lot differently. <laughs> yeah. Know? Um, yeah. So how does that translate into, I guess, with modeling, that whole sense of self-worth and, and that type of thing? Has that, has that been a positive experience for you modeling? Um, and has that sort of built your, your confidence or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I struggled with self-image for a really long time. I mean, I had three suicide attempts as a teenager because yeah. my self-worth was so low. And how I see my modeling now is, is really a sense of victory against that, yeah. right? Like I look down the camera and it feels like I'm looking down the barrel of a gun. Yeah. Right. I'm saying I'm not afraid anymore. Yeah. And it's never really about the output of the product. It's, it's about being able to proudly stand in who I am and represent who I am for that camera. And I think a lot of the modeling industry lacks in representation and being an Aboriginal woman who grew up in a world where no one looked like me, yeah. that was really hard to live. Yeah. It was really hard to map myself in an idea of success when there was no one who looked like me who did it. Yeah. So to be a model now, I don't, you know, do it for pretty shots. I do it because I think, oh, if this, if this goes up on this ad, then someone might see it and it might be inspiring. Yeah. But absolutely. I live it almost as a responsibility to allow the world, this entirely, you know, made up world that exists online and in shops to reflect the real world a little bit more. And if I want my voice heard, yeah. that's also part of my work. Absolutely. is to make myself seen, yeah. even when it's uncomfortable for me, yeah. particularly when it's uncomfortable for me. Yeah, and you are very much becoming a role model that other mm. women can emulate, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, you know. Being an Indigenous and Aboriginal businesswoman, have you found specific challenges or opportunities particularly um, related to that? Yeah, um, there are some challenges, definitely particularly um, in more official worlds, though that's really starting to change. Even in the last 10 years, I definitely see that changing. 
but I don't allow myself to dwell too much in yeah. that area of things are difficult. Yeah. And I really call on anyone who was in that situation to do the same, not as a means to, you know, discredit very real discrimination and lack of representation, particularly, you know, like I'm able-bodied. Yeah. You know, people who have disabilities have even another hoop to jump. So I'm very much acknowledging that there is a diversity problem. Yeah. But to dwell in that can quickly lead to a situation of victimhood. Yeah. What I have found is that that lack of diversity creates an opportunity. Yeah. It creates yeah. an opportunity for me to be in the room and be, actually, I am the only person of color here. Yeah. I'm in the minority of the room in terms of, you know, full women to 25 men. Yeah. It creates an opportunity where my value is then increased. I don't see this room and go, oh no, there's no one that looks like me. I see this room and go, mm, there's no one that looks like me, which means that I am the only one who can speak for myself. Yeah. Which means that my voice is significantly more valuable than the copy and pasted Dan's in the room. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for all the Dan's. No, no, no. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Nothing like, wrong with Dan's. Just nothing wrong with Dan's. <laughs> Lovely friend called Dan's. But it, I think to be able to see that, particularly in a world that's changing where the truth is most businesses want representation and diversity. Yeah. They really do. Yeah. And it looks incredible for them. I'm so aware Absolutely. of that. But I am the perfect poster child. You are. I'm not too you, black you to be perfect. divisive. Like I, I'm, it's literally like, I mean, it sounds horrendous to say, but I'm this like perfectly ethnically ambiguous young woman <laughs> yeah. who just is palatable enough because of the message that I bear, because of the way that I look, yeah. but also diverse enough to tick a box. Yeah. And yeah. that sounds hor horrible because it is, right? There isn't really much true diversity in Australia. No. Yeah. But maybe if I slither my way in, Yep. to all these boardrooms, I can start to push open these boundaries so that people behind me can take the same. And I think this is something that's really important when I talk about custodianship is an acceptance of shared responsibility. Yeah. Right. And it is my responsibility as someone who is that like halfway ethnically ambiguous to open up those doors for people who represent genuine diversity yeah. coming after me. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's beautiful. Um, we can't not do um, we can't not talk about the tiny home that sits behind us in doing this podcast. Um, you built this from scratch, mm -hmm. correct? I'm absolutely in awe of that. How did you learn to build it? Um, and what's kind of been the most challenging bit so far? <laughs> sure. Um, I literally just looked at YouTube videos. Um, oh my God. <laughs> what inspired the whole house at first was that I was talking about sustainability, you know, wanting and talking to people about taking responsibility for the impact of their lives and not in a negative sense, because I think we often get this wrong when we talk about impact of reduce your impact, reduce your impact, reduce yeah. your impact. And I fundamentally don't believe in that. I think that everything we do has an impact in the world, either positive Absolutely. or negative. Yeah. And none of us are ever going to be able to remove all the negative from the world. We can reduce it as yeah. much as we can and offset that by all the positive that I can handle. And what I found was that I was bumping up a lot of negatives in terms of my living situation, in terms of not being in control of the amount of water that I was using or the type of electricity I was using. So this really birthed itself as a project in taking control yeah. of my own life, in taking control of my own impact. Yeah. What it ended up being really was a ode to myself was, you know, it's almost been a year since I started building this, almost six months since I've lived in it. And what I found bit by bit is that I can sit there and look up at it and say, I made this for me. Yeah. I put in thousands of hours of learning and building and hurting myself and crying and laughing for me, for yeah. nobody else. Yeah. I built it in my image, made from almost entirely recycled materials that I you know, collected for over two years, knowing basically nothing beforehand. Yeah. And I learned yeah. for me because I believe that I'm deserving enough of that. And what that's taught me is that it is the same with my house, with my music, with my corporate work, with Bush School, is that you are the only one who can put in work for yourself. No one is coming to build your brand for you. No one is coming to make your business for you. That is up to you. If you yeah. want to be in charge, then you need to take charge. Yeah. And that's the only truth. Yeah. 
when it comes to that. Yeah. And so that's been a beautiful lesson for me is simultaneously that I'm in charge of making things happen and that I have an extraordinary capacity to make things happen for myself. Yeah. But I also need to rest because when I don't rest, things get really wonky in there. <laughs> <laughs> and that I need to apply myself to doing things for me and remembering that, you know, this whole idea of do it for the grind. No, do it for you. Yeah. Not for this idea of your children, not for money. Do it for you. Yeah. That's obviously you're someone that has a really clear why mm. and, you know, your purpose drives you in all areas of your life, you know, from creating your own home to your business to mm. even through to your modelling, you know, and that that's something that I think because there's a consistency of authenticity, it does make your brand really strong, mm. super strong. Can I ask you, and this is a bit of a shameless plug because mm. some of our listeners are probably aware that I am the Workforce Australia Entrepreneurship Facilitator for the Richmond Tweed Ballina region. That means I offer free business advisory sessions, free workshops, networking events, and webinars to small business and new business owners. If you're interested in anything like this, please don't hesitate to get in contact with me. My details will be in the show notes. So Nadala, have you ever worked with a, a mentor, um, individual, or maybe a group of trusted advisors that you um, access for instruction on how to plan out your business journey? That type mm, of thing. Well, initially I didn't. I was very set, and this kind of echoes a little bit that question you said on, you know, when did you know when to ask for help? I was very set on doing it all myself. I was like, I'm an independent woman, I can do it myself. That goes downhill really quickly because there's a lot of things that you need to know how to do. And what I found is that the more help and advice I can get, the better I end up being. It doesn't mean I accept all of it. I mean, I take it on board or anything like that. But what it means is that there's a heck ton of people around me who've walked all different paths before me. Yeah. And there's all this knowledge available. And that's yeah. the only way that I can learn how to do things. I mean, my house is a perfect example of this. I can mess around for about six hours trying to figure out how to do <laughs> point A to point B. Or I can look it up on YouTube and Google it. Yeah. And about 200 people have already done it before me and I can have the solution there. So I rely heavily on asking people questions, particularly people yeah. who have succeeded in ways that I would like to succeed. Yeah. Or people, on the other hand, who are really, really different from me. Yeah. And I like to do this, particularly I think that's how I got so passionate about my corporate work. Because, I mean, I grew up with, you know, very anti-corporate parents yeah. <laughs> in a very anti-corporate world. You know, like, I mean, I lived in squats in Melbourne with anarchist crew, yeah. right? Like <laughs> I came from an entirely different world, but talking to really different people has made my work significantly more valuable. Yeah. So I would, if there's one piece of advice that I can give anybody trying to start their own business, it's take the advice yeah. Yeah. and just give it a go. And if it doesn't work, drop it, that's fine. Mistakes are completely fine. Yeah. Going down the wrong road is completely fine, yeah. but don't go stagnant because you're stubborn. Yeah. Like that just makes no sense. Yeah. In terms of one set mentor, I haven't, I'm in search of, yeah. I haven't yet found one set mentor, but also I acknowledge that the work that I do is very, very diverse yeah. and that the work that I'm doing, you know, whether it's on myself, on the house, in yeah. music. Yeah. I don't have one person that I follow, but I have yeah. a huge amount of people who have that influence you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and just yeah. based on respect. Yeah. That have so much respect for so many people. Yeah. And once you start seeing value in others, you start seeing value in yourself. Yeah. So it's a really good practice, I think, to yeah. seek out beautiful mentorship. And yeah, I did part of a niece course as well, and that was super yeah. useful for me. And yeah. Yeah. For anyone listening or watching, Nice is now rebranded as the Self-Employment Assistance Program and it still does run. It's actually a great program. It if really anyone's is. interested in finding out more, give me um, an email. Um, I just want to finish up with a fast four. These are not questions okay. that are really business related, let's be <laughs> honest. Um, okay. Are you a mountains or an ocean type person? Oh my God, that's such a hard question. I suppose <laughs> that's why I live in the Northern Rivers, both. Yeah. Both. Best of both worlds, right? Like, and I think that's because of the diversity, right? I think everything in yeah. life just keep going diverse. If you go one road for too long, you'll get bored and stubborn in it. Go multidisciplinary everywhere in every aspect of your life. 100%. And I can guarantee 
that it will increase the value of your life, of your work, of your product, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. If money and skill set were no barrier, what would you love to achieve over the next couple of years? Mm. That's a very good question. Um, I don't really ever see skill set as a barrier. I just kind of I love learn that. it. Oh my God. I love that. See, oh, continue wait. learning. Yeah. <laughs> um, money is a really big one. Um, I would like to go on tour again. Yeah. I would like to record a new EP. I'm looking forward to hearing that. <laughs> yeah, I would just try and push out my message as far as it can yep. go. I'd love to be able to run custodial workshops in really remote areas. I'd like to do a tour of detention centers yep. and, you know, offer my work and songs there. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of things. I have a lot of things on. Um, I dream very big. I love a that. lot of things I'd like to achieve. And what I'm hearing there is it's almost just like an extension of what you're doing now. Yeah. And it's literally just almost a scaling of that. Exactly. Well, money's energy. Yeah. Right. So if there's all these things and projects that you're dreaming, money just propels it forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. All right. This is a bit of a silly one. Pineapple on pizza. Yay or nay? Yay. All the way. Oh, I'm with you. <laughs> yay. All the way. <laughs> All right, if you had to listen to only one artist or musician for the rest of your life, you had to choose one, who would it be? Mm -hmm. No shameless promoting of any friends here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that is the most difficult question I have ever received in my life. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, probably my dad. Yeah. Yeah, Joandi Barker. I love that. Yeah. That speaks volumes not just for his music, but for your relationship with him. Yeah. Very, very nice. I also just want to quickly mention that there is an Aboriginal business mentor available in the Northern Rivers um, named John Bailey. So if any of our listeners would love to get in contact with him, you can shoot me a DM or an email. My details will be in the show notes. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, Nadala. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting <laughs> with you. Um, I know that our listeners are going to get so much um, and take that away from our conversation today. Beautiful. And just seconding that, if anybody has questions for me, feel free to reach out. Beautiful. Yeah. You're on all the socials? On you? all the socials. I'm there. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. To our amazing listeners, thank you so much for joining us today. We have touched in our talk on the subject of mental health. If you or someone you know are struggling with your mental health, please access some of the free resources available, such as Beyond Blue, New Access or Lifeline, which are listed in the show notes. Lifeline also has a 24 hour helpline, which is 13 11 14. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please like and share it. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on new episodes. As the Workforce Australia Entrepreneurship Facilitator for the Richmond Tweed Ballina region, I offer free business advisory sessions, free workshops, networking events, and webinars. If you'd like to contact me, you'll find my details also in the show notes. Until next time, remember, you don't need to be great to start, but you do need to start to be great. <laughs>